So please join me in welcoming uh, Jody Dillon. Okay. Jobs that I wasn't really qualified for, 
And one in particular, when I was probably at US Bank for about seven years, I've been a branch manager for about six months. They reorganized and I took a job as a branch manager and I applied for a district manager job, thinking there's no way I'm ever gonna get that job. And thinking that um, I just wanted to tell upper management that this was something that I was interested in in the future. And I was hired. And then it was like, oh, what am I going to do? <laughs> I've got this job, and I'm going to have 72 people reporting to me, and I'm going to have six branches, I'm going to have remote management, and why did I ever apply for this? But that was a leap that I took. And I had lots of peers at the time that didn't apply for those jobs. And I think once I got hired, regretted it, because I was the one that was willing to step out and take that risk. And so if you have those opportunities, try to do that, try to take those risks. Um, and really, I did the same thing in my consulting work. I was hired as a consult that consultant that he was talking about. I was hired to be a consultant in small business underwriting, in centralized small business underwriting. And I had never, did you hear small business underwriting in any of that? I'd never done that before. But I was, because of my background and well-rounded banking experience, they hired me. And that job led to the job where I managed the small business loan centers for what is U.S. Bank now, headquartered in Minneapolis. But if I hadn't taken the risk and taken the consulting job that I wasn't qualified for either, I would never have gotten the job as the senior vice president in a $5 billion loan portfolio and 200 people in three different states. And I never would have had that chance. And all because I took a job as a consultant for something that I really wasn't qualified for. And then um, the last time I took a job that I wasn't qualified for was, you remember you hear that I was a, <laughs> I'm always not, not qualified for my jobs, um, is when I took over the job as the CFO for the bank that I work at for now, right now. I think you heard I'm a management major. I was not a finance major. We didn't have, didn't have a finance major here at UP when I was here. And that, uh, that CFO job was probably the steepest learning curve I've ever had because I had to, just the bottom line, had to remember how to do debits and credits. I had to know how to make entries for the general ledger. And it sounds really easy to you because you're still in school, but 20 some odd years later, I had to go back and luckily my husband is a CPA and my mother's a CPA, so I had people who could call on the phone, I need to make entries that do this. How do I make those? And pretend like I knew what I was doing all the time. But you know, a year into it, again, I knew the job. And if I hadn't done that job, I wouldn't be standing here today as the president and CEO of the bank. Because I rounded out my career both in commercial lending and small business banking, retail banking, and then the finance side, where I was doing things like the call report. Um, I was interacting with our parent company in Utah on a regular basis, finance people, where that's all they did. So if I can say anything, take risks with your career. Take jobs that might not seem perfect at the moment, but might help you get to that next job, because you never know what that next opportunity is going to be. And no job is forever. You can do a job for a year or two. You can always move on and do something else. So my three, how did I develop my leadership style? On the job training. In a lot of leadership, you can read about it, and there's lots of articles, but it's not until you actually have to do it that you really learn the rules of leadership and what works for you and what doesn't. And I've learned from my mistakes. I am not the perfect leader, and um, there aren't many out there that are perfect. And so you have to learn from your mistakes as you go along. And you have to realize that maybe some of you are perfect, but um, I am not, and so I have to had to continuously learn. And the leadership lessons you'll see are things that I've just been jotting down in the last six months. But I've, every one of those is from experience. Every one of those is something. It, there's a reason it's on on that list. So the three things that influenced me and my my leadership style. The first thing was I was really lucky, and I had a father who mentored me as a leader. He talked to me about work when, um, he, uh, even in the military, and a lot of my friends thought, didn't even know what their fathers did. But my father would
would come home and talk to me about his job and talk to me, and he didn't call it leadership at the time, but he talked about how he was working with people at his job and how he was dealing with challenges of his job. And he would listen to me and we'd have conversations about that. And that was really my first mentor. And the leadership lesson there, you might think, well, that didn't happen to me. But there's a leadership lesson in there because he was a leader for me and he mentored me and gave me that opportunity to learn. And I think that jump-started my whole career in banking. And I really point to that as a reason why that district manager job that I said I got earlier that I didn't think I was qualified for, that was because of that background my dad had given me um, as a leader. And he had uh, uh, helped me see that working with people, it isn't about rank. And it, you know you can have great titles on banking, so there's vice presidents and senior vice presidents. But you know what? Rank doesn't really matter um, when it comes to leadership. And if you aren't a good leader, you can have the highest title in the company, but you're not going to be successful. Or you're not going to get the best out of your people. So then, my next leadership um, learning came after I mentioned that I learned a lot on that district manager job, as you can imagine, as I mentioned earlier. But do you guys take Myers-Briggs or this or Hogan? Yes, no. Audience participation, briefly, yes, OK. Um, <laughs> the only person that laughed is <laughs> um, That was the first, I was in that district manager job, and that was the first time I had ever encountered that type of an assessment. And there, it was like an epiphany for me because I learned the most important thing that you can learn as a leader, and that's that everyone isn't like you. And that not everyone thinks the same way you do. And I was, and I'm an extrovert, and I learned a lot about the, those introvert people that I, there are really people out there, and I couldn't believe it, that have complete sentences, they form them in the head before they say them. I mean, how is that possible? I can't do that. <laughs> and that was, and that taught me so much about maybe the challenges I was having with people that reported to me um, at the bank, and um, it helped me understand struggles that I was having communicating with other people, and why sometimes people looked at me like I was crazy because I'd have whole conversations with myself um, because I am an extrovert. Um, it also really taught me that people are motivated differently. And that is critical. Not everybody is motivated the same way you are. And that was, again, another epiphany for me. And everyone doesn't want to get to the bottom line. And still today, today I have an example where I have two people that I work with, our CLO and our Chief Credit Officer, our Chief Operating Officer, that are both introverts and they both like a lot of detail. And I am an ENTJ, if you know what that is, in Myers-Briggs. And I just want to get to the bottom line. Just give me the bottom line. I don't need all the detail. I trust you. I trust that you've done all the work behind it. Just give me the bottom line. And But I have to sit there, take a deep breath, remind myself that, I, that everyone isn't like me, and let them tell me those details and let them feel like they've done their job. Because if I always force them to give me the bottom line, then they feel like I'm not listening to them. And they don't feel motivated by that. And so it's critical that I constantly remind myself of my style, and especially in situations of stress. When I'm under stress, when you're under stress, you continuously remind yourself of these, these lessons, because that's when the your basic style will come out in those stressful situations. And so I'm constantly reminding myself of that and making adjustments. And you know, this is a good example of where leadership isn't cruise control. You're not going to get to a place and you're not going to say, oh, good, I'm a leader now. I don't have to worry about anything. Because it doesn't, it doesn't happen. You're constantly, yeah, it's 25, 26 years, I've been doing this, and I still have to be consciously leading all the time and not just reverting back to my own style. And again, those lessons that you see there 
are probably lessons that I'm reminding myself every day that go back to that style for myself. And then, you know, there's, if you're going to have leadership lessons, probably some of the best lessons you're going to learn are from what the what not to do in leadership. You're going to have some people that lead you, and whether you've already experienced that, or whether you're going to experience that, there are people that aren't always great leaders. And rather than, and it's going to be frustrating to you, and you're going to get upset, but always step back and think to yourself, what can I learn from that? And I have a very specific example of that in my career. I had a um, manager, someone that I worked for, that was a very senior person who liked to pit us all against each other. He thought that was that sort of put him in a cage and let him fight it out was the best way to get the best results. And I think that is not leadership at all. And I don't think I think that's a pretty lazy leadership style. But we also, and those of us that have talked about it since that worked for him at the time, um, found out that he would actually tell each of us privately that he was on our side. So we would each think that he, we'd be going into these meetings thinking he was on our side, but we'd all think that. And then we get in, and he'd rile us up to deal with whatever this thing was that he wanted dealt with, and then he'd step back and watch us work it out. And how, first of all, how productive is that? We were all very competitive, so we were successful. So he had a successful team of people. But how much more successful could this very competitive, very capable team have been if it had been collaborative, if we'd worked with each other? And it took many of us, and it's going to sound silly, but it took us a few years to figure out that he was doing this behind the scenes and that this conflict that I had and that we had with each other was created by him, not by our own conflicts with each other. And so that was probably um, one of the best leadership lessons that I could learn. And I, I, I got very frustrated, and I got very angry, and I walked away thinking, I'll never do that as a leader. And that is probably the best, one of the best lessons that you can get is the what not to do as a leader. So um, it may have, you know, he got short-term results, but not one person that was working for this man at the time that uh, that we were working for him still works for him. And it's been about 10 years, but most of us left within a two-year period once we all got together and talked about it and realized what was happening. So. Um, it can get results. I mean, you guys have probably seen it. Coaches do this sometimes. You can see it. But uh, in the long term, it's not going to get the best results. So, um, so my leadership lessons. Some of you have the handout, and some of you don't. And you can pick it up at the back. And if I forget, I put my phone number and my email address. So if you have questions, you're welcome to call me and talk to me. Um, I don't have any openings in the bank right now, so I'll just let you all know that. Because <laughs> someone said, you think they're going to ask for dogs? <laughs> well, I am assume so. But um, I wish I did, but I don't. But if you want to talk about leadership or if you want to ask questions, because I'm not going to talk about every one of these, because my goal here was to finish this part in 20 minutes, because I know you always want to get out of class early. So um, I would and then take your questions after that. So. These are the things I've gathered. Um, the key ones that are on this list are, and probably one of the most important ones to me, is don't micromanage, let people make mistakes. It's hard, it's hard to let someone make a mistake. But if you let them make a mistake, don't at the back end go, I knew you were going to do that. I knew you were making a mistake. That's not leadership. Let people. I'm sure all of you know, you know, your parents told you to do something one way and you're going to look, you look back now or you're going to look back and think, yeah, they were right. That was probably some of the best lessons you've learned. And it's likewise as a leader. You have, you can't protect everyone. You can't have the safety net under everyone all the time. You have to let them learn for themselves. Choose wisely in those situations, 
don't, you know, don't make it a very serious presentation and oh, I'm gonna let them fail, you know, but let people have those opportunities to make their own mistakes. Another one that I've learned many times on my career is get people onto your bus or help them find a bus that suits them better. Does that make sense? Get, know what your bus is, know what your vision is as a leader, and then help people get on that bus. But you know what? Sometimes not everybody's going to be able to be on your bus. But they're also not going to want to tell you that, and you have to help them. Because what happens with those people that don't want to be on your bus is they become toxic. And they start becoming toxic for the whole rest of the bus. You've seen that maybe in some of the projects you've worked on. You've seen that maybe where you've lived. That's the same thing as true in business. And it's hard. Dealing with conflict is hard. And dealing, you know, you can pretend like that person isn't there that's toxic, but everybody else on the team knows. And everybody else on the team knows you know. And you're the leader. You're the one that has to deal with it. So be sure you take that heart and you do something about it. Because if you put it off, it's only going to get worse. And then your vision gets undermined, and then the team gets undermined, and you're not. You don't have the success that you can have. And as I said, be willing to make hard decisions and have hard discussions. I still get nervous before I talk to someone about their performance. And I've done it hundreds of times. Because you never know how someone's going to react. You can be as prepared as you can be. And you don't know how someone's going to react. I remember the first time I did it, I was an RA here at UP. I remember those first conflicts that I had to help resolve and deal with. And I was really very nervous then, but there's still, I revert back to that, that pit in your stomach, like, oh, here I go, I'm going to do it. And I always, there's a little voice in the back of my mind that thinks, oh, just let it go. Just let it go. You don't have to deal with that now. And you all know what happens. That person undermines the whole team and you get undermined as a leader and because everybody knows you know there's a problem and you're not dealing with it and so then what happens if they know you don't deal with that then they assume you're not going to deal with any of their performance issues either and it's this big snowball that goes down the hill and then be decisive decisions aren't forever just like i was talking about your job that first job you take isn't forever Sometimes you have to just make a decision. Sometimes you just have to be decisive. And, and you know, most decisions in the business are not life and death. And sometimes you have to remind yourself that. And sometimes you have to be willing to just go ahead and make the decision and know that you're going to make the best decision you can right now and know that you can adjust later, that you can change the decision based on the input from your team. But you can change your mind and change, your team can help you change your decision. But sometimes you just have to make a decision and you're just going to need to do that. And the last one I'm going to talk about is worry about what you control and help the team do the same. I had a, a manager oh, probably 15 years ago. I used to get so frustrated with this other group at the company I worked at. They were never doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were never doing it. They, just, they weren't doing it. Why aren't they doing it? Why don't they do it? I don't know why they're not doing that. I wish they'd do that. And he would say to me, worry about what you can control, Jody. And he'd say it to me all the time. And it took me probably about a year before it sunk in. But once you let that go, once you do start worrying about what you can control, and you let go of what other people are doing, and you see ways you can influence those other people, but you let that go, you're going to be a lot happier, a lot less stressed out. And if you let your team and you work with your team on worrying about what they can control, they're going to be happier and a lot less stressed out as well. So there's no magic to leadership. It takes a lot of diligence and work and perseverance. And you have to be thinking about it all the time. And I hope that you all go forth and are great leaders, and take even just one of these points here with you sometime in the future, and it comes
kind of comes into the back of your mind when you're dealing with the problem. I hope it helps. So thank you. Okay, it's now your opportunity to ask questions. Did you have anything that's on your mind in the sense of uh, what sparked your interest as she was talking? Questions about the financial industry, leadership in general? jobs that you didn't feel qualified for. <laughs> How did you cope with that once you started? Stress. something isn't going to be, you know, perfect, you make sure you tell them that and give them a heads up. I didn't put that on there, but no, I, it's funny, the people that um, work for me, work with me, know that um, I don't like surprises. It, it, it's way better to come and tell me something's not going to get done on time than it is to have it not get on time and me to figure it out later, or me to figure it out the next day. So. Next. I know you all came with questions. So I was just wondering, how can you, like in the workplace, identify a leader first and foremost? Or if you met someone or walking into a big room with students like this, like how could you pick out a leader from a group of this size or something like that? I probably couldn't. I, I, I really think that um, it's easy to jump to conclusions about people, and it's easy to uh, base your opinions of someone just on your first impression. But I think when I talked about Myers-Briggs, people have different styles, and someone could be a really great leader um, that is just quieter and more reserved. You know, my first inclination is to, say, to describe someone like me, which is some of them will come right up to me and introduce themselves and say hello and start talking to me. But I know that there's really great leaders out there that aren't like that. And I think that um, you can't jump to those conclusions. These are good questions. How? No one's ever asked me questions like this before. This is fun. What was your biggest adjustment going from UP to the real world? salary for that or a, you know, hourly or whatever for that. 
So it just it, that I think was the hardest adjustment for me. Um, if you could give us one piece of advice uh, of how we can differentiate ourselves from others that are committing the workforce, what would it be? Make sure you know about the company you're interviewing with. Don't come in and go, well, I haven't had a chance to look at it. I was busy. Eat. You're done. You know, but I think that being prepared and having thought through some of the typical questions you're going to get asked will differentiate yourself. Um, show that you're a hard worker. I think that unfortunately, and you may or may not know this, but the millennial generation has a reputation for feeling a little entitled out in the work world. And you, good, I'm glad some people are nodding. Okay, didn't want us to give you like shock. <laughs> but, but there's a certain amount of fear from employers about that. And making sure people see that you're a hard worker, I think, is and you're willing to do what it takes to get the job done, I think will differentiate yourself. Because I work with both kinds of millennials. You know, I've got one that doesn't work for my company anymore that thought, you know, he should be making way more money than he should have, and he wasn't really doing the job, and it just was this constant battle. And I have another that had, she started as a temp, talking about a job that got you, that we were talking, Austin and I were talking about this, a job that you, um, don't uh, think is your real first job. She was a temp answering the phones, and six years later, she's a relationship manager with a, a commercial lender. And she was right out of college. So her first job choice probably wasn't temp answering the phones, but you know she, she sees the opportunity and she's worked really hard, and she's 26, 27 years old. So. She proved herself. Kind of a roundabout answer, but yeah. Could you speak a little bit more about what you mean between informal leadership and formal leadership and why they're equally important? So as a leader, and you will always have informal leaders in your midst. And there will always be people that everyone else looks to for an indication of what they should be doing. Even if they're, they might be looking to you, but out of the corner of their eye, they're looking over and going, what's she going to do? What's he going to do? What's he going to say? And that carries a lot of weight. And so you have to acknowledge that as a leader, who those informal leaders are, and make sure they're on your bus. <coughs> because if they're not on your bus, it's going to undermine the vision that you have as a leader. And so, and it is equally as important because you could, you can lose it if you don't have, um, if you haven't acknowledged those, that informal leadership. Is that it? Okay. So how did you recognize who people were that were toxic in your organization when you first moved into it? Well, one of the things that, that I always do when I go into a new position, and I did this in my consulting work as well, is you spend a lot of time listening and talking to people and figuring out what's going on before you, you start talking, before you start changing anything. And a lot of times it's body language. You know, the people that are sort of, you know, in the meetings, you know, I mean, you can, we can look around this room and see the people that have the body language that, that are like that, you know. And so I think that that's, that's what you notice, and that's what gives you an indication. So then you see someone who rolls their eyes, or that 
sort of is always comes late. And then you just sort of keep watching and see what happens. And sometimes just people are afraid of the change and new leadership, and you just kind of get them on the bus. But other times they never get there, and that's when you have to deal with it. But those are the people you spend a little more time with. Is that it? No more questions. Are there specific tools that you use to get people on the bus? Like when you say that, besides just like being a great leader and like being that, that style that you have, but can you think of other things that you like say you have that you use to get people to make sure that they're going to come along with you to incentivize them or convince them that what you're doing is the right thing to do? First, you have to have a vision, and you have to make sure you're clear in your vision. And you have to make sure that you've communicated that vision. And then ultimately you figure out people that aren't on the bus. And the ones that aren't on the bus, a lot, sometimes I'll have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them or with the people that they report to. And we talk about how are we to strategize about what, how are we going to, let's talk to them. Because usually when someone doesn't want to get on the bus, if they're never going to get on the bus. There's something that's been wrong probably for years, you know, but for them. Or they haven't been happy at this job. They're not happy with their job at all and never will be. And some people you just have to understand a little better and understand what their objections are and hear them and listen to them. And sometimes you have to, there might be a situation they're dealing with at the job that they haven't told anyone, but they carry it around on their shoulders. And if you can deal with that, that helps them get on the bus. You know, but really it's about communication and talking to people and it's having those hard conversations. I know I go back to that, but you've got to have some hard conversations sometimes. And sometimes you just have to put your cards out on the table and say, it seems like you're not on board. Tell me more about, you know, are you? Well, this is why I think you weren't on board. Oh, well, maybe I've misunderstood your body language. Or maybe I've misunderstood how you feel. Or, oh, really? That's the problem? Your chair? You know, you've asked for a chair for the last new chair for the last three years and you never got it? I'll get you a chair! It's, can, sometimes it can be as easy as that. So it's about communicating and talking to people. Anybody, anybody else brave? Am I going to, like, get ready to say I'm done and the hand will come up? Nobody over here. I knew it. I knew there'd be. Uh, as millennials, uh, <laughs> it's a good experience for you. As millennials, uh, sometimes we get tagged as being not as loyal to a company. Like we're told that we'll be moving a lot. Um, does that freak you out as an employer, or how do you motivate us to stick to a company or stick to our first job? Well, I think you heard about my career. <laughs> I'm probably not a good example. I was a pre-millennial, changing jobs every two or three years. Um, it doesn't freak me out, um, but it, it could other people who are my peers, because there are still those people out there that have worked for the same company for 30 years. You know, I don't know. That's just me, but I couldn't do it. But um, I think that you have to show your value while you're there. And you have to, I think as a millennial, there's that initial issue that people have. But I think if you show your value and you talk about what you want to do next, sometimes where you work could be a great place to go and do your next job. I mean, those first 10 years I spent at US Bank, yeah, I worked at US Bank for 10 years. But I did something like four or five different jobs in those 10 years. And so I, cause I got bored easily. And I wanted to try something new. And so if you get bored in your job, talk to your employer about that and see what else there is. And if you're starting to feel bored, start talking about what additional responsibilities you can have and what are other things you can do. I can't stress enough whether you're a leader or an, an employee, communication is key. And you might stay someplace for 25 years just because you kept getting great opportunities. Who knows? If someone told me I'd be in a banker 25 years ago. 25 years, if you see of a bank, never would have bought it. Never would have. But, you know, things happen. So. 
Thank you all so much for coming. And good luck.